Good morning, Wontana Church family. That is one of my favorite songs. It's been around for a little while now. Um, I think it's appropriate in this time of day, you know, help us know that you are near. If you are joining us for the first time, welcome. If you have joined us previously, welcome back. We are in the final part of our resilience sermon series, focusing today on the topic of nutrition. Yes, Ben, I do love my food, and I was not intentionally planning on preaching on this. I'll talk about that in just a moment. Before I get to our message for today, um, I, I want to I want to mention this again. Ben mentioned this in his uh, Living His Love segment, the church community segment. The survey, uh, we're going to leave it open for two weeks, basically, or well, two Sabbaths, today and next week. Just remember, we want you to be part of the solution, because if you're not part of the solution, you are part of the that's not entirely true, but you, know, you see where I'm getting at, right? I'm not trying to guilt trip you into completing a survey. Um, it, it's, look at it this way. It's not just a feedback form where we are the sellers and you are the customers and we want to know how you did it. It's, it's not like that at all. As a church family, we want to do things a little bit differently. Now, there might be some element of, hey, as a pastor, as a leadership team, we want to know what you think. But unlike a retail setting, what we want is for you, even if you are here for the first time, to journey together with us in this church. So when you complete the survey, I'd like you to do that from that perspective. We have a number of things coming up, as Ben has already mentioned. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Watch for the newsletter and uh, announcements in this segment. Um, Thank you, Will, for the prayer. As you know, each pastor, when you see each of us preach, Dan, Wendy, myself, other guest preachers, we have our little, I guess, quirks and styles. Some you prefer more than others, no doubt. I don't need to know which one's which. That's okay. But I do like to pray before I start. Um, and more specifically, I like to kneel. I don't do this everywhere, but I'm comfortable enough to do it here. So please bow your heads with me. I'm going to kneel as we pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I just want to thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to come before you once again. Lord, um, the world is tired. We are tired, but Lord, we are grateful to know that you have you have our best interests at heart, and you are a God who will never tire, that you will be there to encourage, to strengthen, to lift us up. And Lord, as we go into our message for today, my prayer remains the same, that you will hide the messenger behind the message and behind the cross of Calvary, that any and all glory goes back to you and to you alone. Lord, as we open your word, may you not just open our minds, but that you will open our hearts as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, um, if you have been following the series that we've been going through, we are using the CREATION acronym. If you've been following this, most of you should know what each of them stand for, except Brian, because he wants to come up with his own. I'm just picking on you, Brian. Brian does know it. Let, let's do a bit of a quick revision. What does C stand for? C stands for? Choice. Okay. Because that's where it starts. It starts with needing to make a decision, and we talked about choosing to focus on God and choosing to focus on the right people around us. R stands for rest, okay? So there is the element of physical rest, but beyond that, there is also resting in Jesus. E stands for uh, not quite exercise. Some of you are thinking of New Start, which is another acronym. E stands for environment. Yes, exercise also works, but environment is what you surround yourselves with. Dan took us through that. Some doctors, as you remember him mentioning, even prescribe going out to nature as an actual remedy towards um, a certain number of things. So environment A, this is the exercise bit, but it's now A, which stands for activity. So getting up and moving. T stands for... Trust, the center of it all, trusting in God while at the same time looking at your own and accepting your limitations, and we journey through the story of Bartimaeus. I then covered this, interpersonal relationships. 
So we talked about, or he talked about rather, took us through this idea of, um, yes, there are other relationships, but he focused on friendship. Remember the four S's? Solid, supportive, sincere, and sensitive. Not in that order. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. At least I still remember it, right? <laughs> so the four things. Um, solid, sensitive, sincere, and supportive. What kind of friend do you want to be? And of course, when the last week, outlook is O. Your relationship with God defines your outlook. And today we are talking about nutrition. You know, ironically enough, nutrition is actually a really good way to tie up this entire series. Because today's sermon is what you expect, but also not at the same time. Okay? You'll, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Let me start with, I guess, the, the simple definition of nutrition. Now, we took this sermon series uh, from creationlife.com. That's the start of the idea. And of course, we expanded it on our own, and each of us got to do that. But nutrition, according to creationlife.com, defines it simply as this. Yes, it's fuel for the body, for health and wellness. But nutrition is nourishment for the body and energy for the mind. Let me read that again. Nutrition is nourishment for the body and energy for the mind. Understanding the relationship between food and your body can lead to better choices and improved wellness. Now, we can do an entire series on wellness and nutrition. There are certainly at least one person here, probably at least 50 people here who are more qualified than I am in terms of talking about nutrition. But here's how we're going to do our sermon today in three parts, not necessarily all equal parts, as you'll soon discover. Part one is the common sense part of nutrition. So something which just about everyone should know, but common sense these days unfortunately isn't so common, so we want to take a few minutes to go through that. That's part one. Part two, we're going to look at some biblical perspectives of nutrition. And part three, um, I'm going to show you a clip with some practical suggestions suggestions, and then we'll bring it all together to tie up the series, okay? So there's our three parts. This is how we're going to journey through our message and our presentation today. Let's start with the common sense part of nutrition. Let's start with something really, really simple, water. Everybody knows we need to drink water, correct? How much water do we need a day? Eight, cl- eight, eight glasses, eight cups, how many liters is that? Two? Two? Close. So depending on who you ask, women and men lose water at a different rate. So according to, this is betterhealth.vic.gov.au, for women, women roughly, generally speaking, need 2.1 liters of water a day, which is about eight cups. And a cup is about probably that big. Okay? So that's eight cups of water. Men, because we uh, sweat more, I suppose apparently need 2.6 liters, and it's about 10 cups. Depending on who you ask, I've looked up a bunch of research from Harvard Research to Mayo Clinic, seven to nine for women, and between nine and 11, nine and 12 cups of water a day for men is what you probably need. Now, of course, that could vary with age, weight, etc. but this is a general guide. And oh, remember, Coke, Pepsi, kids, that's not, that's not water, okay? I'm talking about water, water. Um, now, let's talk about food, common sense side of food. Now, I had initially intended a plan to just give you some nutritional facts and values about food. But I think you know. What, what do I mean? Let me show you a picture. Tell me if this is good for you. I didn't ask if it was tasty. (laughs) Is it good for you? No. Um, The documentary supersized me, if you've seen it. The the condition was that he would be eating McDonald's every single day for uh, for 30 days. And if they asked, would you like to supersize your meal, he would have to say yes. He gained 11.1 kilograms in 30 days. A 13% body mass increase, his cholesterol went off the charts. So I don't have to be a nutritionist, we don't have to be Dr. Don to tell you that that's not good for you, okay? I have never met someone who ate that and felt fantastic after. Challenge not accepted. So tell me if this next thing is good for you or not.
Uh, not too sure? Yeah? Because it depends on the complex carbohydrates, right? If it's sugar, how much butter you put on it. How about, how about this? Okay, what's, I heard somebody say, what's this? I don't know, but I found this picture on a website called thisiswhyyourefat.com. <laughs> the website has since shut down. I remember saving it. And now there are a few other clones. This is why you're fat.tumblr.com. This is why you're fat.wordpress.com. I just browsed through the site and I kind of lost all my appetite. This is why you're fat.com actually was featured in like a couple of magazines, a couple of um, newspaper articles and things like that. Well, how about this? Is this healthy? Yeah. Well, yes. Okay. Okay, how about this? Some of you are like, I've just put on two, two kilograms watching those slides. <laughs> How about this? Ah, oh, 100%. 100%. Healthy, right? You know, this is common sense. We know that at a base level, we know what is good fuel for our body. And yes, we are tempted to eat all the bad stuff. I like ice cream here and there. I'm just as guilty. But common sense dictates that we seriously consider what we're regularly putting into our bodies. That's, that's common sense. I, you don't need to go to the Bible to do that. I don't need to be a Christian or a nutritionist to tell you that. In fact, if you take away the biblical perspective, I want to show you a government website. Um, in the context of building resilience and mental health, the government has recognized that there is actually a direct link between food, drink, and mental health. This is from, you can't quite see it there, healthdirect.gov.au, which I double-checked last night. So it's about six slides here. I'm going to read through. It's a long article. I'm just going to pick out a few things about nutrition, about what you eat, and how that directly ties into mental health and in the context of our series, Building Resilience. So, eating and drinking healthily may improve some of the symptoms of mental health disorders. Unhealthy eating and drinking habits may make symptoms worse. A healthy diet, listen, high in fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes. Interesting that the government starts with that. Some of you are like, isn't that what the Bible says? Well, we'll come back to that, right? A healthy diet high in fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes, moderate amounts of poultry, eggs, and dairy products, and occasional red meat is associated with a, with a reduced risk of depression. Now, some of you are thinking, is he going to sell vegetarianism and vegan and all that? I could. We'll see how we go, okay? I'm going to keep reading. Diets high in refined carbohydrates, such as snack foods, can increase the risk of symptoms of depression. Eating well also prevents some chronic diseases like diabetes, which also affect mental health. Being overweight or obese can contribute to mental health disorders. Some medicines for mental illness can also cause weight gain, which adds to the problem. Losing weight through better nutrition and exercise can improve mental health. Eating habits can also affect sleep and therefore mental health. It can help to have your main meal two to three hours before bed. If you're hungry, a Tim Tam, I mean, sorry, a piece of fruit or a glass of milk is the best bedtime snack. Alcohol is a depressant. While it can make you feel good for a while, drinking too much alcohol can affect your mental and physical health. Long-term use of alcohol increases the risk of depression, anxiety, and other mental health disorders. It can also lead to dependence and addiction, especially in people who have depression or anxiety, and it can increase the risk of suicide. If you're struggling to eat and drink more healthily, these strategies may help. So the government website suggests three simple things. Mindful eating. If you concentrate on what you're eating, you probably will eat more healthily. For example, people who eat while watching television tend to eat too much at one sitting. Practicing mindfulness and being aware of what you are doing has its own benefits. How many of you in front of the TV? Don't put up your hand. I'm going to move on to the next thing. Healthy food swaps. It can be easier to make small changes than big changes. They're more likely to stick. Swap white breads for whole grain breads. Swap the frying pan for the grill. And finally, going easy on yourself. Change doesn't usually happen overnight. 
Take small steps to improve your food and drink intake. Make changes and practice positive self-talk. Now, a lot of this is, I guess you would say, common sense stuff. Okay? But I just want to put it out there. It's not just a church thing. It's not a guilt trip thing. It's common sense thing. So much so, the government even says, and there are plenty of sites that suggest this. Now, I'll tell you what a lot of these common sense stuff don't suggest. They don't suggest crash diets. Have you done those? You know what I'm talking about? Um, I'm not an expert, but giving up something altogether, yes, it's good, and some of us do need a cleanse, so I'm not talking about that. But what you want to do is not to have a diet that lasts for 30 days, lose however many kilos, and then you go back to your unhealthy lifestyle. It's about a lifestyle change. I'll talk about it at the end. The challenge, of course, is not that um, we don't know any of the stuff. I mean, is anything that I've said here new to anyone? Like, oh, I never knew that eating a triple stack of burgers with triple cheese is bad for me. It's it, not, nothing, nothing new, right? At the end of the day, it's not just about what you should do. It's about what you are able and willing and can do. The ball is in our court. And now we come to the second part of our message because as a Christian, now interesting, it notes here that it's about self-talk. It's about, you know, all that stuff. About things that, you know, just be, don't be so hard on yourself. It's about accepting yourself and all that stuff. Yeah, there's, there's power in that. But we come to part two because from a biblical Christian perspective, we have a little bit of extra help. And here's what I mean. The Bible says in uh, 3 John chapter 2, we talked about the common sense. Now we talk about the biblical perspective. Some of you will be familiar with this, so consider it revision. We begin with John chapter 3 and verse 2. The Bible says that, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So prosper in all things, be in health just as your soul prospers. So there's a direct link between your physical health. If you prosper there, then your spiritual health, your soul also prospers. I acknowledge that in terms of illness and sickness, a lot of times it is out of our control. Bad things do happen to good people. But the intention of God, of Jesus, is actually so that we have an abundant life here. The Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 10, I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So God wants us to be in health. He wants to give us an abundant life. And this next part, some of you can probably tell me and preach this next part for me because you've heard it, you've practiced it growing up. If you've grown up in the church, the original diet in the Garden of Eden was not KFC and McDonald's, right? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29, and God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Original diet. There's no doubt about that. Is it possible? Well, hold that thought for just a second. Pop quiz. Who lived the longest in the Bible? Methuselah. Okay. How long did Methuselah live? Oh, some of you are very, very good Bible students. The Bible says that Methuselah lived 969 years. How many birthday socks did he get for those 969 years? And I believe it was 969 healthy years. So there's something to be said about the original diet, okay? But then the flood happened. The flood happened, the massive change that happened, happened during the flood, and pop quiz number two, how many animals did Noah bring into the ark? Okay, the first answer, if you ask people on the street, they would say two, right? One of each kind. 
Yes, Leonard, thank you. The Bible actually says a little bit more than that, okay? So, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 2, God, God tells um, Noah, you shall, did I say Moses and the ark? Noah, I meant Noah. If I said Moses, I didn't mean to. God said to Noah, you shall be, you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. And it was seven for two reasons. One for sacrifice and the other to eat. So it's interesting because the Bible makes a distinction between clean and unclean right in the seventh chapter of the Bible, the first seven chapters of the Bible. Okay? We're going to... Uh, look at the book of Leviticus and go through it in a little bit more detail, God repeated the instruction, but the distinction between clean and unclean, it predates the nation of Israel. Um, I'm not going to go through it in a lot of detail. I'm just going to bring out a few things. Some of you are very, very familiar with this already. I, I have to say this because we also have an online audience. I've had this comment say to me, it's just for the Jews because it's in Leviticus. But this goes back right to the beginning, right at the flood when there was no Jewish nation, okay? And this, was go, uh, this goes back at the time of Noah. There's also another thing I do need to mention, and I need to clear about this. I feel like as pastors, as preachers, we don't make this clear enough. So I want to make this clear. What I'm about to read to you is not a prescription or a roadmap to salvation. Are you, are, can, we, can we be clear on that? However, I do believe that there is a reason why God gives us instructions. There are some things that, 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 the, that God gives us for other reasons other than salvation. I believe it enhances our walk with God, and this is the distinction, this particular part here between clean and unclean. I'm not going to go through everything in detail because you could probably preach, so I'm probably just going to take five minutes and go through this. We read a few verses. The, the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 3, Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat. What does that mean? Well, the Bible gives some examples in verse 4. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, it is unclean to you. So, this is a shock to you if you went and bought a side of camel at the butcher's store last night. I was bring, planning on bringing camel burgers to our picnic later on. It probably tastes like chicken. I don't know. This is what the Bible says. Christopher looks disappointed. No, no, he doesn't eat camel burger. 11 and verse 6. The rabbit, though it chews the cut, does not have a split hoof. It is unclean for you. Time to check out that rabbit head. You, no, that's a terrible picture. Just, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna move on. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 7, and the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cut. It is unclean to you. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I'm gonna read just one short quote from this book, "The Chain" by Ted Genoways. This is what he says. He said that pork products are likely, pork products are likely, contain, are likely to contain fecal contamination, urine, bile, hair, intestinal contents, disease animals, toenails, you name it. Feel free to read the book. It's $45 on Amazon. Just don't do it before dinner. It's not a bad way to lose weight. Um, one quick comment. You're going to read research? Read it within context. There's some research that says that some things are good for you. That's almost akin to saying speeding is good for you. Yeah, it's nice. It's endorphin and it's adrenaline, but doesn't mean there's no danger associated with it. The Bible continues in Leviticus chapter 11, verses 9 to 10. These you may eat of all that are in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales, whatever in the seas or in the rivers that you may eat, but all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, or that move in the water, or, or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. What does that include? Basically, crustaceans. Crayfish and shrimp are bottom feeders. They eat the junk off the bottom of the seafloor. Oysters and shellfish are fil filter feeders. You know, in 2016, 
um, scientists actually created oyster colonies to clean up Sydney Harbour because they filter out metals, junk, and they improve water quality. Each oyster can filter 24 liters of water a day, where does all that junk that the oysters filter out go? Well, I don't know. Leviticus 11.13, maybe this last, this last verse I'll read about this. And these you shall regard as an abomination among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard. So no vulture lasagna for you. You can read through all of this. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. So as a general rule, ch- ch- chicken, fish, some fish, beef, they are clean. While it's not a salvational issue, not even close, I believe God gives us these instructions for a reason, and I believe it warrants our attention. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So I've told you, you, know, you have to be a good Adventist now and do this. Give up this, that, and the other. Because if you don't, you are not glorifying God, right? Have you, heard, have you heard pastors say that? Yeah? There's some truth in that. But look at it this way. Maybe God just cares about you and wants what's the best for you. How many of you are parents here? Many of you here. How many of you give your kids whatever they ask for? I certainly hope not, right? If we do not see his rules as a good thing, we'll never learn to follow it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. This is from the New Living Translation and verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Nutrition is not the end all. And I'm glad we're finishing with it because it ties it all together. What you eat, how you eat, actually makes a difference. I want to make this practical, and we come to our final part of our message for today. Some of you are doing quite well already, undoubtedly. Some of you are eating very well. But let me say this. Being skinny doesn't mean healthy. Okay? I think, are we clear on that? Being skinny doesn't mean healthy. In fact, you can be vegetarian and be super unhealthy. Okay? So we can go into that. Um, there's a direct connection between healthy eating and a healthy mind. Be practical, eat smart. Don't be drastic, but be intentional. When Nadia and I met, seven years ago now, right? I was quite unhealthy for my weight, for my height. I was 85 kilograms. Now, you're like, oh, that's, that's nothing. And yeah, but for my for, my, for me, for my build, for my, for my, you know, and all that stuff, 85 kilograms is, was quite unhealthy. Um, for somebody who was a very active sports person, and for my lack of muscle at that point in time, it was just unhealthy. That was 2015. Um, obviously, Nadia married me, and so we're Okay. <laughs> We went through some rough patches in our relationship early on, not so much to do with us, but just other factors. And leading up to that point when Nadia and I would start dating, I love my food. Ben, you are 100% correct. I love my food. I love cheese. I love the stuff that you should, that there, you know. But it had a lot more to do with the stress and what happened behind it than the actual loving of the food, if you know what I mean. 
We worked out that stuff, Nadia and I. My diet started to naturally get under control in the year leading up to, the, to, to our wedding in 2018. In that one year, I lost 11 kilograms. I was very healthy, 73, 74 kilograms. It was nice. I was wearing tighter t-shirts, you know, that sort of thing. I was exercising, I was going to the gym, I was playing sport. It, 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 it's, it's nice, it's nice. And then you got married, and as you do when your wife is such a great cook, <sighs> I put some of that back on, not all of it, and I hover between 75 to 80 kilograms, which is probably a relatively healthy-ish range. If it's muscle, if it's fat, then you calculate BMI, it's not entirely accurate. So 75 to 80, which is quite healthy for a little while. Okay? That included putting on two or three kilograms when we went to Hawaii. That's another story altogether. <laughs> And then COVID hit. Anyone felt stressed and depressed during COVID? Or am I the only one? I can't be the only one, right? And other things begin to happen outside of church, outside of Nadia, that took a toll on me. When I finally had the courage to weigh myself again in January this year, I was 90.5. Some of you can relate, some of you are like, I couldn't button the top of my shirt. I... And the thing is, it wasn't even the food, it was just everything else around it. The food was just a byproduct. I was about to start a New Year's resolution because the New Year is the way to go, right? First week of January passed. Second week of January passed. I told Nadia, I'm going to start after our anniversary because we're going to, we have this nice weekend booked away and all that. And I was just tired. I was just tired. Not tired of eating, but just tired. <laughs> I was just tired. Can anyone relate to being tired? As much as we plan this resilience sermon series for the church, I think God had a sense of humor because I probably needed to hear it more than any one of you here. I don't purport to put on a brave face. I, what you see is what you get. But about the time we plan the series, as I'm planning with Dan and Wendy, you know, let's, let's, let's do this. Let's encourage the church. Let's help them build resilience. You know, I'm putting on my pastor's hat. And as soon as we've done the planning, as soon as we've done the topics, I'm like, God, you need to speak to me. So in the final week of January, I thought I'd better get my act together. I had some goals, I told Nadia, but I decided I was going to make it sustainable. I wanted to do something, but I wasn't going to make it grandiose. I wasn't going to say, honey, in a year's time, I'm gonna, when we get married, I'm going to be 73 kilograms, I'm going to be fit into my... I, I didn't want to make anything. It was just, you know, I told Nadia, let's just, let's just have a simple goal. We had two weddings in March. I told Nadia, I just want to fit into my suit. Is that okay? Let's just, let's, just, let's just go with that. So I've been this, on this journey for the last nine weeks, starting two weeks before our sermon series started. And it's ironic that I end up with nutrition. <laughs> because um, why not Wendy, right? I mean, Wendy is the healthiest eater of all the pastoral team, I think, Dan. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, yeah, Dan, Dan might be, right? <laughs> Last week of January, 90.5 kilograms. I weighed myself yesterday. I weighed myself this morning, actually. 
um, I was 85.4 kilograms. That's five kilograms in about nine weeks. Now that's, I appreciate that. That's, that's way more than I expected. Though I did think, huh, j try Jenny Craig. How about we go with try Yong Shin Chi, you know. <laughs> Eat your heart out loud and easier. Right? I'm thinking, man, now granted, my metabolism is better than, 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 because I did exercise, I used to exercise a lot. Um, and I don't believe that, you know, you can lose. Now, what did I do? I, literally what I did was these few steps that I'm going to show you in this video. I hadn't even watched this video until this week. But somehow God is just, he has this miraculous way of saying, you know, in fact, Dan, I think Wendy was supposed to preach about nutrition and yeah. Yep, Wendy was supposed to preach about nutrition. I'm like, oh, phew, just, just dodge the bullet there because I don't want to be a hypocrite, right? It's ironic we swapped the thing around and we were like, oh, I guess I have to and I better preach something. And so God has this sense of humor. He's like, you've been on this journey. Now you can share it. All I did was just small, simple steps. Um, there are a few things in this video I'm about to show you that I actually still struggle with. Uh, the snacking, uh, yeah. <laughs> the planning of the menu, which is what he talks about. Sometimes I'm on the road during the day. It's hard to factor that in. But check out this video, the small steps that we can take. Okay? It's a three and a half minute video from Creation Life About Nutrition. And then I'm going to come back and tie it all together. Do you have a favorite food? Something you love to eat that makes you smile? Maybe it's something you have on special occasions, or maybe it's reserved for family get-togethers. may even be something that you love, but others wonder why you do. Can you see it? Can you taste it? Can you smell it? Food is important to us, and for many reasons. It's emotional, it's family, it's celebrations, it's what we need to survive. And how we eat, when we eat, and why we eat is just as important as what we eat. And that is why we need to eat smart. The original diet that God gave to Adam and Eve was one that was rich in plants, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds, and lots of fresh, clean water. It was a simple diet that provided the nutrients they needed. But the world has changed. The original fast food was obtained by walking by a tree and picking a beautiful ripe fruit or bending over to grab a handful of colorful berries. Now it's sitting in a car at the drive through or grabbing an overprocessed snack from a vending machine. Foods can be both healthy and healing. Studies have shown that eating three servings of whole grains a day can reduce the chance of dying from heart disease by 80%. Certain nuts can raise HDL levels, the good cholesterol, and beans, they can lower blood pressure and help you lose weight. So, want to improve the way you eat? Here are some tips. First, make a menu. Many people don't know what they're having for supper tonight because they didn't plan. When they get home, they're hungry and just about anything in the refrigerator looks good to them. Or they may stop and grab something pre-made or pre-packaged on their way home. Well, planning a menu means less stops at the grocery store, eating more nutritious food, and saving money. Secondly, cut down on snacking. Your in-between meal eating can actually ruin an otherwise healthy diet. One solution? Stop buying snacks. If something's not in your house or not in your desk, you're not going to eat it. So stop the temptation by taking away the object of desire. Thirdly, drink water. Water helps you maintain your energy level and keeps your brain functioning at its very best. Also, drinking water between meals helps you feel full, staving off the hunger pangs until your next meal. And finally, don't think you have to change your diet all at once. Start by eating an apple at lunch. When you add more nutritious foods to your diet, there will be less room for the unhealthy foods. And don't make losing weight the focus of your nutrition. Going on fad diets or eating foods to trick your body into burning fat are rarely a long-term solution. Mindful eating with an eye on nutritious whole foods is always your best path to better health. Live healthy, live whole. That's Creation Life. I love what Wendy said last week. 
Choice, rest, environment, activity, trusting God, interpersonal relationships, outlook, nutrition, these are all gifts. And like any gift, we have to make a choice to accept it. Doing one single thing isn't going to fix anything, isn't going to help you build resilience by just one thing. But a cumulative step through each one of them. We are the ones that gain in the end. I believe that these principles will help us not just have a healthier lifestyle, I truly believe that it will help us build the resilience that we need in the times that is so, that that is just, that is just tiring today. So at the end of the day, my prayer is that we can give our full attention to him, to give all the glory back to him so that we can do what he wants us to do. I'm going to invite the praise and worship team to come up. As the song says, all of my days I will sing of your greatness. All of my days I will sing of your grace. All of my days I will tell of your wondrous love, your love in my life. As we start a new series in a couple of weeks, in a few weeks' time, may we take some of these practical steps and just implement them slowly. And I'll do me a favor. Don't ask me in nine weeks how many more kilos I've lost. I don't know. But my intention is to continue on this journey slowly, one step at a time, by God's grace. Let's stand as we sing.